Uh, welcome everyone this afternoon for uh, today's seminar, which will be um, presented uh, by Leila Fawaz, who is the Assam M. Faris Professor of Lebanese and Eastern, Middle, uh, Eastern Mediterranean Studies at Tufts University. Uh, she received her PhD in history from Harvard University, and among her many publications are An Occasion for War, published in 1994, uh, and A Land of Aching Hearts, The Middle East and the Great War, published last year in 2014. She is currently researching the changing nature of collective memory and the evolving legacy of World War I in Lebanon and Syria. And in 2012, she was awarded the title of Chevalier in the French National Order of the Legion of Honor, not something we can say about every speaker uh, who addresses uh, this <laughs> gathering. Uh, but this afternoon, she will be talking on the subject of her recent book, uh, A Land of Aching Hearts, uh, The Middle East in the Great War. Leila Fawaz. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to speak at the Washington History Seminar and to be here really with such a great company. I thank uh, Eric Anderson and I thank uh, Christian Osterman for this. And I also thank Amanda Moniz and uh, Peter for answering so many questions in the last few weeks, <laughs> as if I'm the only person in the world. I'm really sorry. Uh, most of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Dana Kennedy for his role in getting me invited and his help with so much related to this talk. It's really an honor that he set all this in motion. And for that and for his welcoming kindness and yours, I thank you again very much. The title of my book comes from a line in the journal of a Turkish feminist, Alide Edip, in an episode about her travels by train through the villages and stops from Anatolia to Homs during the Great War. She remarked on the haunting sense of misery that she encountered. In the villages, not a man was to be seen because many had died or been conscripted. Locusts had devoured the fields and famine shadowed families and took their lives. She wrote, I'm quoting, we were in the second year of the war and already the villages, women and children looked as if they were at the end of their strength. The end of the war was their concern more than anyone's. They not only had their beloved at the front, but they also had to supply Turkey and her army with the means of living. I have seen, I have gone through a land full of aching hearts and torturing remembrances. When I watch on television all the refugees of the current crisis in the Middle East, I cannot but recall the suffering of so many more people in the Middle East at times of great upheaval. Much of the suffering today is due to the settlement of this great war, which I studied for the book that I'm talking about. And I cannot help worrying, as so many of you must. Are we going to make things worse now? Again, in the ways we settle this current crisis, when we mean to make things better? And what about the memory of suffering? People still talk of the Great War as a turning point for the region. Will new bitter experiences add their weight to making relations among people even more difficult and burden the Middle East with more tensions? The destruction caused by the First World War in Europe is covered extensively, but many in the West do not realize the level of destruction and upheaval caused by the First World War in the Middle East. To the peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Great War was a break with the past, far worse than any other. I got interested in the topic first because older members of our extended family used to talk about the Great War and how much it meant to them and the immensity of the losses 
caused by the war that they heard about. Second, the topic is also important to understand how much of the violent past is responsible for what is happening now. Do we learn from the past? Does the memory of the past affect our interpretations of the present and the possibilities of the future? An agreement drawn during the First World War, known as the sachs picot Agreement, involved, as many of you well know, the division of spheres of influence between the British and the French should their side win the war. Roughly, most of today's Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq were designated British, while Lebanon and Syria were assigned to the French. No representatives of these areas were part of the agreement. It was <coughs> negotiated in secret and in contrary to principles of self-determination that would later become one of the centerpieces of the person we are here uh, because of him, the Wilson's 14 points. The forces of anti-colonial nationalism would have many more battles to fight before they could free these areas from European domination. The French mandate, as it was called, that replaced the Ottomans after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War was foreign to the people who had no say in their new government. This redrawing of borders for a future Middle East got media attention <coughs> recently because ISIS specifically set out to overturn, even if symbolically, to overturn Sykes-Picot in one of its publicized tweets. In fact, it's the only time I remember the media talking about World War I in America, <laughs> while in Europe and the overseas they talk about World War I and it's 100 years since then. Here, ISIS got us to talk about it. Uh, the ISIS bulldozed the berm uh, between Iraq and Syria and claimed it was smashing Sykes-Picot. The reference is important because it tapped into a lingering resentment towards the West's unilateral drawing of frontiers. This resentment resulted from the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the end of the Caliphate. So in this way, even ISIS has helped bring world attention to the Sykes-Picot Agreement announcing that it will smash it. This raises the question, why are old agreements from a century ago at the center of heated debates in the Middle East? Because the suffering endured in the Great War in the Middle East was central to the misery of the 20th century. And because decisions taken then have affected the relations among peoples of the Middle East, but also between the Middle East and the colonial powers that ruled the Middle East after the end of the war. Sometime between the 1920s and the 1970s, the countries of the Middle East acquired independence, but independence with problems tied to the First World War. If the current Middle East is so involved with the events of the First World War, why did I choose to write my book on the present, not on the present? but on the Great War of 1914-1918. It is because, uh, to me, it seemed impossible to understand today without studying the period that the book focuses on. Focusing on history is a must to make sense of the present. Memories live with us in the present. They are transmitted from one generation to another and affect the present, not only the past. Refugees, who move from their places of origin to distant lands might have an opportunity to get over the past, although they rarely do. <clears throat> but what about refugees who do not move far away from their areas of origin? It affects even the Palestinian Israeli conflict, other conflicts. So, what about those refugees who do not go very far, can see the land they come from and the tensions they have lived with and remember? <clears throat> they settled close by where they came from, remember their suffering, and pass it on to future generations who keep the past alive, pass it on to those not yet born, in textbooks, novels, 
theater, music, and keep up all sorts of remembrances that are handed down and perpetuate the horrors of war. Before turning to the book, I will give you an example of how experiences from the past color the present. During the 1975-1990 war in Lebanon, I was a student at Harvard and could not work for uh, the 75-76, the first few years, I could not work on my PhD thesis because of the horrors of the civil war and how much it took from people. I'm sure some of you here have experienced the same. Then one day in the middle of the night, a Lebanese friend called me to tell me that her father-in-law had been burned to death with a bunch of other people because his identity card said that he was of a sect different from the enemies that had caught him. I knew the father-in-law and his very moderate political viewpoints, but it was useless that he was a moderate in a savage phase of the civil war, where memories of past differences affected how people interpreted who was their enemy and who was not. I did not sleep that night and then decided that I was either going to become insane or really uh, drop school. Uh, and it was a very difficult period where in the end really history saved me. I found refuge in the past. I started studying history backwards and found at least some peace in uh, dwelling on the past and not on the present. So alive and so relevant is the past that as a graduate student in that same uh, period of time, in the 70s, I attended a conference at Princeton University on the Millet system of the Ottoman Empire, which recognized the Millet system, recognized the subject of the empire through their religious leaders, not through national identity. It was a multinational empire, and uh, nationalism was yet a minor factor. A supporter of na Arab national sentiment called me angry that I was participating in the conference, saying I was delighted, it was my first conference, I was so delighted that anybody invited me. But he made me feel real bad because he explained to me, uh, I wasn't mature enough politically perhaps, he explained to me that the conference had received a huge Ford Foundation grant so that the old Ottoman millet system be revived to counteract Arab nationalism, a sort of return to the division of society per sect or ethnic group. He doubted that the grant had been given out of innocence, but to shape the future and weaken national aspirations. And in a way, this suspicion is reported today a lot. People talk about what's happening now in Iraq and Syria as an effort to break Iraq and Syria into smaller units and weaken nationalism. I mean, the Kurds, the the Alawis, the Druze, etc. This is all being talked about again today by people who do not trust the intentions of those who are helping the different parties. So the connection between the present and the past, the manipulation of the present and of the past, all of it is discussed and real for the peoples of the Middle East. Suffering endured and not forgotten is at the basis of these concerns and fears and they need to be understood in order to figure out what's going on. The links between the past and the present affect our identities. The Great War transformed the Middle East, bringing to an end hundreds of years of Ottoman rule in Arab lands, while giving rise to the Middle East as we know it today. After the war, extensive areas of the former Ottoman Empire and of the Syrian provinces, known as uh, Bilad al-Sham, or Greater Syria, were carved up into mandated territories to be ruled by colonial powers, the British and the French mostly. Those against foreign rule would have many more battles to fight before they could be free from European direct domination. And during, during those decades, in addition to redrawing the political maps of the Middle East, World War I ordered altered the everyday lives of the people of the region and begun a long process of reshaping their identities, which is really what I am interested in. 
I'm not strong on political history. I'm better at social history. But it is part of this picture. In the US media, the issue of identity in the Middle East is regularly represented as one of religious hatreds that date back to time immemorial, according to some. In reality, there is not one individual reason for how we got where we are. There are several. There is a drawing of borders I just talked about for a future Middle East, which is now getting attention. Important also were the numerous strategies over our long 20th century to prolong old divisions and create new ones, divide and rule in the region, as different states have used different strategies to impose their vision and will on the populations that are under them, but also on their neighboring populations, and they hope to stir up the pot. We also know that the eruption of violence can be tied to socioeconomic issues. We have seen people of different sects help one another in times of crisis, and people of the same sect take different positions in times of conflict, based on an economic need and rivalries differences. There are also the more nuanced and long-term collective effects of the war on society. Cynicism was one outcome of the war. It's a big thing in the Middle East. The promise by the Allies to respect and support national aspirations took second place to realpolitik. And the peoples of the Middle East learned the hard way not to trust any rulers' promises, their own or foreigners. Cynicism in small doses can be useful in politics, but the massive disappointment felt after the outcome of the First World War led to a depth, depth of distrust in government that did not bode well for the rest of the 20th century. Also, experience with war left its mark on the population. On the eve of the war, people in Europe had gotten used to peace as one great historian of the war in Europe uh, put it, uh, Margaret, um, the one at Oxford. Thank you, Margaret Macmillan. She, she, she said they had had almost, a, not completely, but almost a century of peace when the war broke out to the opposite of the Middle East, where the people of Europe, of the Middle East, in fact, uh, had already been exhausted by all sorts of wars, including civil wars. They had been also exhausted by conscription to go and fight here and there, and by years and even decades of service in the army from, uh, from the army away from home, often not making it possible to ever return home uh, and be with their families, so that the families themselves suffering because they had to survive by their wits and with very few resources coming from the low income of the soldiers. In fact, before even the First World War began, the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 had so exhausted those who were conscripted that when the First World War broke out in 1914, many did not realize the break between, on the one hand, the Balkan Wars, and on the other, the First World War, and saw it all as one continuum of conflict and forced <coughs> conscription. Then, when the First World War began, most did not see or write about it as a war with a worthy and noble cause. To them, there was no great war. There were many small separate wars. This is a very important point that should be elaborated if we have time. The fact that they saw it, you know, a war of my province, sub-province sub of Syria a war in Egypt, a war in what became Jordan, etc. They saw the region, they focused on the region, and did not think of the whole, not yet. Indeed, most Ottoman <clears throat> soldiers did not see or write about the war as a worthy, noble cause. To them, there was no great war. Some of you may have seen the movie American Sniper, which I saw because I liked Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and one of the remarkable aspects of the movie is how it showed how firmly the sniper, uh, Chris Kyle, believed in what he was doing. It was very shocking to a normal person to see a sniper <laughs> so exciting about what he does. Uh, he believed in the nobility of what he was fighting for, the killing and the good cause behind it. 
But this was not the case, as far right. as I can tell, for the Ottoman soldiers in 1914. They were not animated by such ideas. They were dealing more with day-to-day -day survival. It alienated them from their society, and they were uh, suffering and fighting to have enough food to, to survive, and even to survive, they had to steal. One witness reported that every time a battalion of soldiers passes in the street, we would see the street vendors running away with their trays and their carts that carried food and sweets for fear that the hungry soldiers would snatch them from their hands. It is only decades after, and that's what's so interesting in memory, memory changes the past. It is only decades later that the memory of the war evolved and began to be described as a great war of suffering, what was called Safar Barlik, or mobilization, and the great ordeal of barefoot soldiers crossing cities, deserts, whole regions away from home, as well as the great ordeal of starving civilians facing famine, locust, disease, uprooting, dislocation, and levels of misery so profound and so lasting that its memory was passed on from one generation to another. In the West, the war hardened and solidified already formed national identities. In the East, the war shattered the imperial Ottoman system that for all its faults and for much of the time allowed a multiplicity of identities to coexist. The losses were staggering as the war did not only destroy armies, it also destroyed societies and economies. In this way, the experience of World War I in the Middle East is perhaps more akin to the experience of World War II in Europe. World War I for the Middle East was as bad, perhaps, as World War II in Europe. The social, economic, and psychological effects were deep and devastating. The war ravaged the land. The experience of the war was immensely damaging, not only for conscripts and soldiers, but also on civilians. It has been estimated that the countries of the Middle East suffered more proportionately than any other belligerents, including Europe. In Greater Syria, estimates put casualties conservatively at around half a million. This is not to diminish the social disruption and suffering experienced by the West. They were immense. It is imprudent to weigh the balance of human misery in equivalent measures. The point, rather, is that the experience and memory of the war were altogether different. Many of those who actually fought the war did not remain in the Middle East after the war. Many of the Indians who fought at Kut in Mesopotamia returned to India. Many of the British forces under Alembi that drove across the Sinai and up to Damascus via Palestine with the Arab irregulars on their flank outpacing them and keeping the Ottoman army off balance and on the defensive. Many of those went back to Britain and its colonies. Many of the Germans that supported and advised the Ottoman allies returned to Germany. But, but, but the local population, recruits and civilians who survived the war, stayed home. And in staying home, they were the main keepers of the memories, those who will hand down the memories to the future. Yet, learning about the past and remembering it is properly, is very difficult at all times. On the one level, there is a private nature of memory. We cannot remember what we do not experience. So in looking at how memories of the war shaped identity in Greater Syria, it is important to understand its private, personal characteristics, but also its public, broad-based nature. The civilian experiences of the war varied across a wide range, from those who lost everything to those war profiteers who made fortunes in this war as in all others. From Ottoman pashas trying to stay in control to locals who became known as martyrs, hanged, hanged in 1915 and 1916 in Beirut, Damascus, and Palestine. Um, uh, sorry. 
because they were accused of collaborating against the Ottoman rulers on the side of the Entente enemy. The civilian experiences of the Great War also included the men who died in battle, the refugees who did not survive long <coughs> marches deprived of the, of the most basic necessities, the women and children who were exploited, and those who found opportunities for some autonomy in villages that previously were controlled by husbands, brothers, and fathers. In one way or another, a vast majority of the people simply endured. Among them were also those who worked hard to start the business, but then had to move their families around after the outbreak of the war and even the conclusion of the war. On another level, there is a broader, more public nature to memory, in how memory is used to reshape and rewrite the past at the group, at the official, national, or collective level. It is something nations and their national figures try to do. Those who were in power at the time of great conflicts and survived them derive the history of the war to drive their particular points home, to justify the failure of some leaders to rise above their own <coughs> parties or interests, and their failure to put their interests below those of their nation or their people, or to give themselves glorified roles at stressful times for their people. In this context, it is sometimes very hard to see heroes among our leaders in the Middle East. I searched for leaders and heroes while writing this book. I talked to very learned people who have studied the Middle East, political scientists, historians, people who have lived the great times. Some of them were in their 90s, some of them were much younger. I searched for heroes, but frankly ended up admiring the common people. Excuse me. I'm sorry. You're okay? I'm, I'm, I apologize. No problem, I need to break, thank you. <laughs> Couldn't find heroes. If you do, I'll be delighted. There are statues, statues here and there. <laughs> We're abundant with statues. I can tell you, I can tell you, maybe it would be improper now, uh, a joke about these statues. Remind me to talk about Assad and statues. <laughs> <laughs> But I looked for healers, and frankly, I ended up admiring the common people and not their political leaders. Ordinary men and women often survived war with dignity and courage. It was harder to find leaders who were fighting for broader causes or ideologies rather than their own interests. I realize this is very cynical and I apologize, but with time, say by the mid 20th century, some of these leaders and politicians began to write memoirs in which they gave themselves important roles in the Great War. Some political figures were right to do so. They were justified to make a case for their own heroism. Less studied, and for some of us more deserving, were the ordinary folks who survived war and had no reason to embellish how they lived it or how they remembered it. There is simplicity in their depiction of the war and its remembrance. What do we make of the gap between what people tell us happened and what really happened? It is an important question because it is important to get clarity about what happened in the past, the violent past, and make it possible for the younger generations to expect accountability and to get it. The absence of accountability is dramatic and essential in the part of the world that I know. Learning about the past or remembering it properly is difficult at all times, but not explaining the past clearly confuses the present. How war is li lived and invoked was brought to my attention recently. Last fall I was in Beirut, I was on sabbatical, spending an evening with the family when a relative commented that she wished she could find a good and balanced book on the Lebanon War of 1975-1990. To learn about the war, tell her children about it. And she's now 45 years old. She was seven in 1975 when the war broke out and 22 when the war ended. 
And she spent many of those years, either in Europe or in the Arab world outside Lebanon, which was being completely torn apart. She said that she is surprised that many of the same politicians, the people talked about during the civil war, she used to hear those names as a child and as she was growing up, many of the same politicians still dominate the political life of Beirut today. She is surprised that this important civil war is not covered properly in the children's textbooks, that there is no official history people agree upon, no private recollections one can trust to explain the war to generations after her, her children and after. And this lack of impartiality in the recollection of the war confuses her. She wishes someone could tell her who did what in an objective way, at least in a more objective way than she hears around her. She asked, is there no memory of the war that she could trust? This is an example of the smallest level of the relationship of memory and war, how people lived it and tried to remember it. What do we make of the gap between what people tell us happened and what probably happened? Again, personal anecdotes bring out the contradictions between what we hear and what may be true. One of the most disliked figures of the First World War in Greater Syria is that of the Ottoman military governor, Jamal Pasha. He made Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others suffer with his policies during the war. Today, several historians have begun to paint Jamal Pasha in more positive terms, defending his motivations, actions, and choices. It is not uncommon for historians to keep rewriting the past and reinterpreting it. In this case, Jamal Pasha. But from the perspective of most of those who lived under his rule, he was the one to blame for much of the misery endured during the war. Sometimes it was wrong to blame him, but he was blamed for it. There was local unanimity in calling him a tyrant and an oppressor, a murderer, on and on. The names, the adjectives he received in his lifetime were extraordinary. One of the few unifying memories of the war, in fact, comes from the local criticism of Jamal Pasha by members of different religious sects. The dislike of him finally united the Lebanese. <laughs> Nothing unites them. As a very good lawyer in Lebanon, who happens not a real historian, but he's a better than historian, he said that the only thing uniting the Lebanese at that point in time was what they said about Jamal Pasha. Otherwise, they were at each other's throats. And so, um, as I said, some Turks have begun to change the picture and some non-Turks as well. But at the time, people, the population, blamed him for much of their suffering. And yet a little girl who knew nothing about politics or about him liked him. Jamal Pasha and the Prussian commander of the German forces in Syria had their summer headquarters in a village in Mount Lebanon. For those who know, it's called Bahamdun. When Jamal Pasha went about the village in Hamdoun and saw the little girl who later, as an adult, told the story, the Pasha invariably warmed up to her, played with her, cajoled her, and said something nice to her. Then, as his relations with Arab nationalists got very bad, and he blamed them for wanting to be independent from the Ottoman Empire, he got angry at the nationalists. And when he passed the little girl, he paid no attention to her. When that happened, she ran to her mother in tears because Jamal Pasha had ignored her and not paid her the usual attention he used to give her. So the whole of Greater Syria might have been scared of the Pasha and disliked him intensely. But for that little village girl, he was a nice man whose attention she missed. Remembered as the great and fearsome commander of the Ottoman forces in Syria by most, he was remembered as a likable elderly figure by this one youth. Do we trust these contrary visions of one figure of the Great War? And do we conclude that remembrance can be contradictory, is uncertain, fragile, and yet real? <clears throat> Perhaps some of the complexity 
of the relationship between memory and war is that the gaps between what people tell us happened and what probably happened are simply the result of different interpretations of the same public figure and event. Those who study the Great War think of it as the worst of times, a time of suffering and deprivation. Yet listen to what one renowned uh, writer says about it. He experienced the Great War as a secure youth, sheltered and surrounded by family and village traditions that infused his formative years with stability and joy. He writes, as for us youngsters, we did not care much about the war and the news. We were happy during the summer of 1914 because we were back to our playgrounds. We left the news of the war to the adults. As time went by, he of course realized the suffering caused by the depth of the famine, the locusts that ravaged the areas, the loss of relatives who never came back from the front, and the other disasters that war had caused. But that he had so many happy memories in the midst of disaster is real. Read or talk to people who lived the wars of the Middle East then and more in more recent time and probably today. And they will dwell on some extraordinarily happy personal memories in the midst of tragedy. A walk, I remember Kamal Salib, the historian, telling me personally that. A walk on empty streets in peace, unheard, in the midst of checkpoints, shelling or kidnapping. The warmth of a family gathering and personal friendships at times of great loss. All a mix of terrible fear and fragility with intensely memorable and appreciated souvenirs of times with those they cared for. The private versus the public. The familiar versus the distant. The experienced versus the untested. It all lived at the same time or in succession. And it at once tainted and enhanced the recalling of the past decades after its happening. The passage of time altered recollections. In the decades after the war, the older village people spoke warmly of the Ottoman Empire and did not recall the Ottomans as having been particularly foreign or oppressive. What became foreign to them was the French mandate that replaced the Ottomans after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the war. Among women of, of the village I talked about, the year of the French, when they took over the Ottomans, 1918-1919, is remembered as Sint al-Ihtilal, the year of the occupation. The French were not liked, and suddenly the Ottomans were good memories. In fact, the movement of uh, Nostalgia for the Ottomans has remained because modern borders have been so disruptive. People say at least we were all one. We did not take a passport, we could travel from area for it. It's become very common to look nostalgically at the Ottoman period. But you ask my mother's generation what they think of the Ottomans and it's slightly different. The passage of time also shaped the future. Allies in war became antagonists, rulers and ruled after the war. Rulers and rule, not equal anymore. One population flow was the massive arrival of British soldiers and imperial subjects into and through the Middle East during the war. This brought various imperial citizens and subjects, Englishmen, Welshmen, Scots and Irish, Australians, New Zealanders, Indians, West Indians, into contact with the population of the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And in making contact, they developed prejudices, prejudices. They developed their own opinions, their own perspectives about one another. The war played itself out in the Middle East and Africa, and not only on the Western Front. It proved pivotal to incorporating these regions into global networks of imperialism. And in doing so, the First World War did not just lay down new imperial structures, but also helped to crystallize existing prejudices and to foster new stereotypes formed in times of conflict. 
On the one hand, soldiers drawn from different empires gained a first-hand experience that formed the basis of a mixture of condescension, disdain, and grudging respect towards the people of the region. On the other hand, vice versa, local populations began to perceive imperial aims in a more negative light as they became caught in the territorial schemes of the colonial powers, and as the horrors of war engulfed their homeland, tarnishing, tarnishing the luster of Western modernity, which in the 19th century they had been so enamored with. Thus, the First World War was not just a moment of rupture, signaling a break from the globalized world before 1914, but also a moment in which new networks of global integration were formed. Did such contacts and encounters have lasting effects on the perspectives of outsiders to the Middle East and on local populations towards each other? In particular, did the relationships that developed between military officials and soldiers with each other and with the local populations during the war affect the relationships that emerged after the transitional period from war to mandate and during the mandate itself. It is reasonable to assume so, because when one compares the eagerness to copy and learn from the West to the current wariness of its intentions, this is an important point. It is reasonable to assume so when one compares how eager people had been to copy the West <coughs> to the current suspicion and wariness about its intentions. In that sense, the First World War, far from putting an abrupt end to the first age of globalization, heralded the elaboration of new networks of movement, bringing unprecedented numbers of military and technical personnel to the Middle East. But in doing so, it served to entrap the region in new global structures of imperial governance and to lay down the foundations for enduring mutual suspicion. What is quoted more often is more negative, and I will show this by ending with a quote from the poet Khalil Gibran, who is heavily admired here and a little perhaps less so in many circles overseas. He was a poet who was born in northern Mount Lebanon in the late 19th century, and he is most famous for his book The Prophet. But he wrote a poem called Dead Are My People, which is a lamentation of the losses. And it says, my people died from hunger, and he who did not perish from starvation was butchered with the sword. And I am here in this distant land, roaming among a joyful people who sleep upon soft beds and smile at the days <coughs> while the days smile at them. In conclusion, there may be, for the present, a lesson. There may be a way out from violence and suffering. Distrust is not irreversible. Soft power is still an option, rarely used, but it's there. And it has proven its effectiveness before. And it can do so again, but perhaps not in my lifetime. Thank you. <laughs> And now we turn to our discussion, question, exchange portion uh, of uh, our talk. Uh, we will open the floor. We ask for you to wait for the microphone. Uh, and when it reaches you, A, use it, and B, identify yourself before you speak. We have a hand right up here on the, my right side of the table, in the front here. While she arrives, I want to mention that I recognize several faces, and I'm grateful to see you here. I'm particularly touched to see a former student who had an indispensable role in the book. Uh, Peter Rao, raise your hand. He works in Washington. Any clever person would hire him, but he's already hired. <laughs> he is completely brilliant, and I'm so happy that you took off to come here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amanda Thank you so much. This is a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, it's very interesting for me to hear you because I remember as a child, my grandmother told me about the blockbuster and the famine when she was a child in 1915. And then in 75, when we had the civil war, my grandmother would say, don't worry, the, the Ottomans will come. 
and save us. No, you know, I love it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really amazing for me to live this. And But my question is about what brought us here? I mean, I listen to the news and I see now the Russians are literally on the ground in Syria for the first time. Even during the great war, the Russians were not there. I mean, you have new powers now occupying us. So after 100 years, we are back to square one, <clears throat> back to being directly with great powers on the land, and we have no control of, over our fate. I mean, now the Americans and the Russians are talking about, they have been discussions about what to do about Syria. There is no presence for the Syrians. There is no voice for the Syrians in this. Where, why, what happened? Why did we come back to this place? Thank you. Thank you. I loved your first part, uh, and your grandmother mentioned. Thank you so much for mentioning this, and for your question, which is at the, at the heart of all this. Uh, they had opportunities to to help themselves. I'm tired of blaming the outside. You know, maybe I've spent a lifetime blaming the outside world, <laughs> but but enough. You know, enough. I mean, Assad has been in Syria for how long? His father has been there for so how long? He, he controls a quarter of the country, and he still thinks that he let them all die, I'm staying. I mean, it, it, it's very hard, especially when you teach. I find it harder and harder to, to say nice things about these things. Um, I should, correct? Because you don't want to encourage prejudice. So, so yes, the Russians and the Americans may be taking advantage, and they contributed immensely to where we are uh, by their, playing their war games in the Middle East. But why, why do we let them also? So I'm not answering your question. I'm saying that. Yeah, my question: What happened to us? Why? Why do we let it happen? Years, yeah, we're the same place we started years ago. Maybe we're not made to to run ourselves. I don't know. I've always felt that it's not a very academic answer. That the Middle East fares better when you have one strong power in the area whether it's the Ottoman or before them other empires. And it's a terrible thing to say because it means that if you have one strong Middle Eastern power, however authoritarian and miserable he makes his people, the Middle East seems to do better when there are a million little choices. And, and, the, and, the, the, and the Middle East before, there was representative government. There were diwans, councils. There were opportunities uh, to, to speak up that have been taken away and the wait and wait for a Western time of democracy, which is not going to happen uh, in my lifetime, as I said. And so it is worse now than it was then. It, it just, uh, it's, first I'd say stop, we should stop looking elsewhere for answers. And second, um, they tried to have an Arab Spring. Look at the catastrophe we're in. And the only thing I want to add is that it's an embarrassment for me because I spent a career defending the region whether it's social habits, things that they do that we don't approve of. Or, and now I find it almost impossible to do. I thought two years of leave would cure me, but I am still very <laughs> negative. And you don't need to agree, you know. I, I know it's an unusual. But we have suffered so much, and people have suffered so much. I mean, I listen to my sister-in-law, who's very pro-American, who um, lives in Dover, Massachusetts, and loves it. And she remembers 1983, when the bombs from the ships of the United States came to Mount Lebanon and, and how she had to, hid, to hide as a younger woman in the basements. And she did not know much. She just knew the bombs were coming and she hated America then. So that, you see, it's the, the living the war. This one is mine. Okay. Take it out. It's okay now? Yeah. So that uh, um, it is very hard to, to give an answer to a problem we haven't been able to solve. I don't have the answer. Does anyone, surely some of you political scientists, <laughs> you may have an abstract, yes. I, I, I'm not choosing you, choose one. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yes. My name is Graham Pitts from Georgetown University. Thank you so much for your talk and your important work. Thank you. I want to push your cynical vision a little further when you talk about <laughs> sort of sympathizing with the common people of the war. And I know in your book you talk about a couple of characters who are collaborating, who are locals, but they're collaborating with the Ottoman regime. This is something that's been left out of the narratives, right? Both the narrative that blames the Ottoman Empire for everything that happened during the war in Jamal Pasha, but also this later narrative that you mentioned, which sort of um, sees European imperialism as the source of the Middle East problems. 
So I'm wondering if you can find any systematic class conflict during the war. Do you follow what I'm saying? Are these isolated cases of collaboration? Or is the aspect of the war that's really been left out, that really hasn't been struggled with, is the fact that a whole class of people on the ground are benefiting from the misery of poor people. So to be clear, just to conclude, you presented the war as a rupture. Um, would I be correct to suggest if there was continuity between sort of class of people who have political and economic power in Beirut and Lebanon before the war, and that that power is increased during the war, and those are sort of the same people in charge after the war. It, so that, that's an even more sort of... Collaboration. Co collaboration is my question, yes. Collaboration, you know, we have words for them now. In Iraq, they call them collaborators. We didn't even use that word before. So collaboration is part of life. It's okay. Uh, some people are going to benefit, and some people are going to uh, not be part of the ruling class for a while. But... Uh, the problem is um, that the, the, it is true that the foreign influences have been colossally important in all that. They've taken what is advantageous to them. If at what, Look at them. They're fighting the Shia in Yemen, and they are uh, the reason why the Shia became strong in Iraq. I mean, they try to make sense of it now, correct? I mean, the US used the Shia to weaken the Sunnis before, and now it suits them to do the opposite somewhere else. So. It takes two. The two sides are playing very, very confusing uh, battles with each other or using one another. So everybody is using the other side. And uh, it is not only the local people who are taking advantage of the collaboration. I think it's everyone who is. Over here, gentlemen, all the way up front. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thomas Julian, I'm a uh, teach uh, history of nuclear policy at the airport. Oh, my <laughs> But um, I'm interested because my father and grandfather, uh, Armenians, left Turkey in 1913, which was a marvelous time to go. Uh, but in that regard, um, the issue of uh, almost a class um, stratification uh, in the Ottoman Empire, after all, what opportunities for collaboration were offered to the Armenians, the Greeks, uh, and other uh, non-Turkic uh, peoples in the, in the Ottoman Empire. Beyond that, there is the United Arab Republic, which was another attempt uh, by Nasser, in this case, to establish a relationship between Egypt and, and, uh, and uh, Syria. But I have a question. In your remarks, one could almost uh, take the implication that now, uh, despite the fact that uh, the borders of the region were drawn by the imperial powers in 1918, 20. Um, that there is now a sense of Syrian or Iraqi or a Lebanese national feeling. Is that in fact true? That it has time actually established some sense of a national identity within those artificial borders? Thank you. Um, the, the Armenians uh, had supporters, of course they had supporters. We know some of the famous ones, including the ambassador to Turkey at the time, etc. And uh, I do, um, I sympathize with the Armenians, but for the sake of fairness, I want to mention that some of the people I respect the most, including Feroz Ahmad, who, who tries to be fair for both sides, is a great historian. He says that if you sit in Istanbul at the time, uh, the Armenians were seemed to be a fifth column with Russia. Correct? And so they saw it as a, a, a collaborator, an enemy. And so they did what they did for that reason, while the Armenians know that a lot of victims were innocent younger people, etc. So the Armenians are a very important part of that story. There are others, but we, we know the Armenian, what they have suffered for it. And I, I discussed this in my book, and Peter remembers how much we worried about the Armenians and their role in the Middle East, because it's so important. Um, <coughs> the uh, time has brought in a sense of identity. I remember uh, um, a few years ago, I had uh, in class uh, at the Fletcher School uh, a student who was Kuwaiti. And uh, he said to me, I don't care about the Palestinian issue, I'm a Kuwaiti. And to me, who had grown up in Lebanon, I was stunned because the, the Palestinian issue was the, 
the center of the politics I grew up with. Maybe today it's not true anymore. I think today they talk about Sunni Shia disputes being more important. But in the period I grew up in, uh, this was central to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But as a Kuwaiti, he did not see himself at all as a pan-Arab or an Arab. He saw himself only in his in his country, in his... Uh, and a lot of this has happened. Um, I remember once taking a bus uh, from Lebanon via Syria to Jordan, and um, we arrived to the... This is a great story. We arrived to the border uh, between Syria and Jordan, and relations were very bad between them at the time. And the Syrian soldiers came in and threw out all the clothes, all the things that belonged to the people who were trying to cross border in the most incredible way and throw them, throw them out. And the woman next to me was very, very angry. And uh, we were talking and I, she said, I'm a Sunni Muslim. And I said, practically said condescendingly, oh, remarkable because I'm a Christian and that's how I feel. And she looked at me and she said, you Christians of Lebanon have never understood that we the Sunnis feel completely Lebanese. You see, because my stereotype was that she was going to sympathize with the others, but she did not, and she was highly insulted by it. And little episodes like that, they have proven over and over and again that they care about identities. Yes, time has worked in favor of separate nationalisms, but uh, for that you need some peace. You need some regional peace. The main block has been not the inability of peoples of the Middle East to come back to to the, you know, the question we are talking about. It is not that the peoples of the Middle East cannot rule themselves, but that there has been no regional peace, no peace to speak of. When you think of the number of wars, inter-Arab, Arab-Israeli, inter-Muslim, Iraq, uh, Iran, etc., the number of wars that have occurred, there hasn't been time to build up uh, something beyond the state. On top of that, the states, as I said very early in the paper, have used um, opposition abroad to say that the opposition abro abroad is working with the opposition at home to, to undo them. Nasser saying, for example, that the people uh, are, are working in one place against the other. And so if you're not going to trust any opposition on the basis that it's making an alliance with the enemy across the frontier, then, then you won't have peace and you can't make uh, things work out. Um, hello, my name is Marta Rebetic, and I'm formerly from Fletcher School, Taft University, and Gallaudet. Um, I'm also from Yugos um, sorry, from Croatia, which is former Yugoslavia. Mm. And what you've been telling really rings the bell, <laughs> all about this memory and grievances and the issues, and it seems like history be repeating itself. And so here's my question for you. I, and many people say, well, you know, the downfall of Yugoslavia, I wouldn't say just by that, but when you say it's a revenge of the Versailles order falling apart. So my question to you is, when I look at the Middle East today, I feel like um, some of, at least part of solution, will be drawing new borders. And when I say that partitioning, I don't mean that it can ever be complete solution in partitioning, but it may be a way of managing differences for some time until identities get reshaped. And I was just wondering, and, and, and I know this is very difficult, as I said, I, I, I watched the boring, boring Bosnia and in Croatia, I was actually there at that time. I was just going to ask you, what is, what is your opinion about this, the issue of borders? and maybe some change of the borders, can he help, in some cases, to manage the differences, not necessarily completely resolve all the problems, to manage these identity issues? What is your opinion? And um, I want to say, I was also with Professor Hirsch Hannum, who is, of course, doing self-determination as my PhD advisor. Thank you. Um, Another partitioning, it's hard to trust it. It's simple, it's hard to trust it because of the mess that has been done in our region. Perhaps in parts of the world where the superpowers agree something is possible, but in our region, you know, I cannot think of many that were useful or successful. Um, so that's why even though we just said that states are being formed, 
you know, I, I would be very frightened um, to see new partition. It's being talked about all the time, and people are scared of it. And a lot of people we know are saying, you know, let's go into smaller units. That's the solution. Partition into smaller units, because then you are with your own people. How are you going to make it homogeneous? With the religions of the Middle East, with the ethnic groups of the Middle East, with the diversity of the Middle East, how are you going to make anyone homogeneous? And what are you going to do about the movements of populations, which are the most important factor about history nobody talks about? You know, just look at the television these days, and you see, you know, these people moving, moving, moving. And it was that from antiquity. It never stopped moving. So, so I am a little, I I'm, I'm a historian. So all I know is the past. But I am a little, a little worried about, because it's talked about, about partitioning as a solution for a better future. Who am I going to trust? The people? Trump? I mean, who am I going to trust? <laughs> you know, those who are going to rule here or rule there? It's very hard to know that they will be wiser than we have been. <laughs> Dave Ottaway, I'm here at the uh, center and a former Washington Post correspondent in the Middle East, spent a lot of time in Lebanon. Um, when you're dealing with the memories, past memories of the Ottoman Empire and the Mandates, uh, how much difference did you find in the Christian memory, in the Sunni memory, in the Shiite memory of all of these different periods in the history of, that you've been discussing? This is a very good question. Uh, I mentioned one historian of Lebanon, Kamal Salibi, because I, I'm a great admirer of his. And his most famous book, I'm sure you've heard or I've read it, uh, um, House of Many Mansions. And what he said is there isn't one house, there are many to form the modern Lebanon. There is a Shia view, there is a Sunni view, there is. And yes, it's very different. It is very different. Um, and yet, very often, they, they prefer to live together than to live. Uh, with enemies. I mean, the Druze, the Druze are very happy with some ways to live, and the Sunnis sometimes prefer alliances. They have proven they prefer alliances with the Christians and with the Shia. Uh, so, so there isn't one view of Lebanon. Maybe it's one of the reasons why nobody's writing, writing the, the past. But there is, is there a, a shared memory of, of the Great War and of the history of what happened? On the level I deal with stories, social classes, the, the, the bottom up, the suffering, yes, a lot, a lot of it. And uh, there are petitions written, uh, for example, against one Salam because he was hiding the grain from the First World War so that the others don't profit. The signatures are Christian <coughs> and Muslim. So, you know, at the level of suffering, yes, but at the broader level of vision of history, I don't think it was completed or is complete. Uh, you have something to add? Uh, no. Oh, okay. So there is. Uh, I wanted to add one point, but I can't remember now. But let me do a follow up, if I could. Please let us stay on the question yeah, of memory. Yeah. So we have the issue of different religious groups have different memories or interpretations or histories of what transpired. But me people who study memory highlight at times, not always, but at times, that memories aren't just these natural things that are organically grown out of communities and experiences. They are cultivated, they are nurtured, they are distorted, they are transformed, they are taught, they are propagated, and I can go on and on. So in the case of the story that you are telling, and assuming that it's not just, you know, one parent to a child, grandparent to a grandchild over the years recounting this past, uh, but that states, governments, um, local communities, schools, etc., consciously attempt to use history or memory for their own purposes. So in this instance, uh, how are these memories cultivated uh, and passed down? To what uses are they put? Uh, and if they're treated this way, are they really memories? Uh, or are they simply kind of inculcated understandings uh, of the past that are put to political uses? Uh, 
it is so true, both of it, that some of it is memories and a lot of it is, as you said, incalculated the, the world into the people. But you have the incredible case of a country like Lebanon where we grew up um, without being taught the history of Lebanon. We were, I could draw the map of France, district by district. <laughs> Unbelievable. Maybe that's why I got the Chevalier. You know, we knew. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were really um, completely francophone, completely francophone. And I remember very well that when they taught uh, uh, Arab history, Lebanese history, it was the time to to take chalk and put it on the chair of the professor and joke and laugh. We never took those those times seriously. Lebanese history, Arab history, was the jo joke time. We did not take it seriously. Now French history, we took very seriously. So there is some of that in, in the case of private schools mm -hmm. in the country where private education is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, they have... Uh, Syria, Iraq have transformed the countries into only listening to their bad ideology. I mean, the generation of my mother and grandmother Everyone spoke French. Afterwards, nobody speaks French. They've all been totally Arabized. And in, in a good way, they know their own languages at least, much better than we did. But uh, they, it's the, the government vision of what history is. And this is true everywhere. It's true here also. Yes. It's used here, but one thing I admire about the United States is if there is a problem, it's talked about. Over there, it's hidden. When I was a kid and we went to the mountains, you would pass the Palestinian camps and the Lebanese had built walls. You couldn't see the camp. You just knew there was a Palestinian camp. And then the schools would take us on picnics sort of to teach us better, not picnics, teach us to look at those camps and to see how people live. But, but aside from them, nobody saw them. So it was a distraction, but you never knew what was happening. Here, every day, they talk about black-white problems. I mean, this is something I admire. Racism is something very much talked about here, despite all its problems. So there is a way to avoid issues overseas that here, at the moment, is not being practiced. But yes, um, the use of the government and of probably private missions and everyone of how history is written uh, makes it very difficult to know what the truth is. And um, I, I don't know whether it'll get better in the future. Mm -hmm. What do you think, if you've studied the subject? <laughs> I mean, he's a big expert on colonialism. What do you think? <laughs> 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 Don't drop it in, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, Stanley Falk. I'm a military historian, but of another war in another part of the globe. So. Uh, excuse my naive take, this question is naive, but what about the Iranian influence in Syria? And isn't Iran, in a sense, another foreign power meddling in Syria? <laughs> they are all interfering into each other's affairs. <laughs> And the, the, the Iranians uh, do not seem to have done more harm than those who are supposed to be better at this. <laughs> they, they haven't actively, uh, they've been very clever about how to work on their influences. They have sent good ambassadors who speak the local languages. They have built long, long, decades of educational contacts. They have replaced the government in serving uh, uh, medical aid, educational aid, money, uh, school aid. Uh, so they have mixed very, very useful uh, role socially to replace the government that is doing nothing with their own effort to weaken the people who stand against them. And uh, the PLO used to do that very cleverly, too. People never understood why Arafat lasted as long as he did. Well, they were the government for those people who were suffering. They, they provided a lot of services that nobody was providing. And so the failure goes back to the government, who did nothing. For example, the south of Lebanon had no electricity 
up to a couple of decades ago, electricity. I mean, the situation was so basic, so ignored. And the, the Iranians um, supporting Syria, what choice did they have? What choice did they have? Everybody was boycotting them, serious boycott, you know, of all sorts. And here was a weakness that they exploited and made it their strength. So I'm, I'm just explaining why they would do what they did. The other choice was to stay isolated in the Middle East. And Syria was heavily isolated at that point. It had refused to help and participate in some of the Gulf Wars. It had isolated itself. And so the support of Iran made it part of the world, the global, the global fight. But uh, it's, uh, the, I mean, Hezbollah got where it was because of its own weaknesses more than Iran. Hezbollah emerged after 1982, after the Israeli invasion of 1982. And before that, the Shia had always been uh, not a military movement. But after 1982, everybody admired them because all of a sudden they were the only ones who had the courage to stand for their country. Where were the Falange? Where were all the others? They were hiding. Nobody was there. The Sunnis had no soldiers. Nobody cared in a moment of crisis to fight for their country. And so at the beginning, Hezbollah was really a party defending their land. And later on, things changed, and they became more ambitious, and they wanted to control Lebanon by any means, and they did all the mistakes that their leaders in Lebanon have made. So in the same way, one could say at different points in time, Iran's motivations has been different, and they have played on the local weaknesses, but the local weaknesses is really at the base of what's happening. But I do suspect we have some Iranian experts here who know better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the lack of trust in the region that comes from uh, betrayed promises, <coughs> promises that were made and not kept. And I can certainly think of, uh, I'm not a historian, but from what I know, I can think of promises that were made to specific leaders, you know, who say that uh, was expecting to, to get to rule Arabia and so on. But were there, uh, did the populations of this air region of greater Syria have specific expectations? I mean, in other words, did they feel that they had been, uh, that there were promises made to them that were not kept? Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, sorry, I'm Marina Ottaway, I'm a scholar here. Uh, yes, they. If you, depending who you ask, yes, they were all hanged and killed and put in, you know, taken out of power. But normally when you think of Arab nationalist sentiments, you don't think of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the hotbed of Arab nationalism, even up to the days of Nasser, was the area between Egypt and, and <coughs> Iraq. And that's the center of Arab nationalism. So the Syrians had, had been the first, um, Albert Horani and others have written, about the, the writers who began to imitate ideas of the West for autonomy, independence, federalism, parliament, and the ideas of creating entities where they would have representation in a bigger whole. But how much of the population was involved in this? In other words, certainly there was this elite, the, the, the nationalist elite that expected that. But was that a widespread sentiment? That it doesn't matter if most of the population is rural, not educated, not uh, able to write and read. So that, yes, it was mostly an elite movement all over. But this was changing already. It has been shown that uh, when war broke out, had there been no war, most of the population of Greater Syria and Iraq would have been very happy to stay in the Ottoman Empire. They wanted more representation. But only secret societies talked of independence, yes. But these secret societies were very important. And it has been proven that if the Arabian Peninsula came out as the part, the head of the Arab revolt, it was not for nationalist reasons. It's because of the fight of one group of aristocrats against one group of aristocrats. You know, he, he, you know the, the Sharif Hussein was upset because the Ottomans wanted him to pay more taxes to, to the Committee of Union and Progress, and because the relationship between Tur Ottoman Turks and the 
uh, rulers, the governors of the provinces were not as good. So it was an old fight of nobility against nobility. And it's only with time that uh, others came into the picture. So in all these cases, it is a class issue that the, the leaders cared. But they were enough to carry their people. And when they decided to take part in it, their people followed them in the Arab Revolt, for example. But Syria, and, uh, Syria could not do it. Greater Syria, meaning from Palestine to Lebanon to what is Israel to, to what is uh, Jordan, etc. They could not do it because they had been squashed. The Ottomans discovered those talks of independence and secret societies. And Jamal Pasha, that's why he's unpopular, made sure that they had no power and couldn't do it. So the, the, the hotbed of Arab nationalism was totally weakened at the time when it was needed. And so the center of power moved to the peninsula where we never think of Arab, we still don't think of them as a source of nationalism. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let me use the prerogative of the chair to ask a question. Um, you're here at the Wilson Center, home of the Cold War International History Project. <laughs> and as you know, we're really into documents, into archives. <laughs> if you could talk for a moment about uh, the, the sources for your book and your research. Um, you know, some of it, by the sounds of it, was more anecdotal, but clearly there's, there's much more behind it. And then if you could perhaps um, elaborate a little bit more generally about, you know, what kind of archives, what kind of sources are there to write that history that you, you know, rightfully uh, um, say has not been written, needs to be written? Um, that is um, an enormous amount of sources, as you suspect. It is uh, better to be a historian based in, on the Ottoman Turkish story, because they have unbelievable archives that have never been classified. But they are there, and they have been used by wonderful historians all over, from Washington to elsewhere, using the famous Ottoman archives. So there is a lot of material based on what the Ottoman government collected. They were collectors of archives. They had censuses taken. They had uh, the constant uh, uh, checks on all sorts of issues. Um, and they, uh, we have all that material. And some historians have made a very good history out of it. In the Arab world, it is still mostly private collections of government. For example, there is a very good co set of collections in Egypt. And people have used them until the recent past. Uh, um, and then in every country, Syria. Syria was ahead of all of us because Syria took its past seriously, collected an archival center that was phenomenal, and they just kept, they called them either the, the, the Islamic papers. If you got married, if you died, if you sold a piece of land. So you, ha you went to that, what looks like a private collection of archives, but really it's collected in a place that people recognize a historical society. A lot of those countries have them, and, and you can look at them quite far. So there are a lot of those sources around. There is also the enormous, enormous European sources. There is a whole museum just in London itself. And uh, all my work before was based on, on such sources, you know, from the public record office to the war office, etc. And I got very interested in the storytelling. It was my own choice. And in memoirs, many of which had never been used. So there is plenty to do for generations of historians ahead. And, uh, and it's very exciting. One thing worries me, for example, um, there is the Museum of Beirut, which had a lot, because I used them. They had a lot of archives. You go and ask now, and they say, no, there isn't anything. It's not true. <coughs> but have they moved them to hide them during the war? Have those who moved them not want to talk about it or kept them? They, the young people tell me they can't find them, but it is not true. It is there. The municipalities of all the, the municipalities, of every one of these countries, the municipalities of every town in every country have a lot of documents also that can be very useful. There are poor documents that tell you the movement of people, even if it's in Marseille, you know, because uh, Marseille worked very closely with the, with the uh, Levant that we are interested in. So. There is so much that uh, some of it is, is governmental, a lot of it is private. And the problem with private is uh, people think it's <coughs> unimportant and they want to throw them out. And there have been 
a big, big effort on the part of uh, various groups, for example, the German Orient Institute, wherever they are, try to get collections of, the, of papers from the local people. Uh, but uh, the, the, the governments of countries that care about their patrimoine and their history have done it. Lebanon has not done it because Lebanon is uh, very independent in the way it approaches things. But certainly the great, the great autocracies, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, have the better collections. May I violate a protocol and throw a question? One second, microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. It's, there's a question. You know something? She, she's behind you. Uh, does one need to read the old Arab, uh, uh, the Ottoman script yes. to exploit these, these yes. archives? Yes, yes. And uh, the tragedy, of course, is that the young Turks did not study their old, their, their old uh, but the historians among the young Turks have learned how to use it because they are very keen on their history. They're very good at understanding the importance of history. But it's not, uh, it, it cuts down a lot of young people. Uh, the Israeli archives now have a lot of things on the Palestinian situation, and I know a lot of people who have worked there. So th there is an enormity of material everywhere. And uh, usually it's possible to access it, but you need to spend two years over there and, and be very patient, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're almost out of time, so uh, we'll actually have the last couple of questions. I don't know if I should uh, be um, worthy of the last question. But not quite the last. I, so. no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a scholar, but I'm, I'm certainly impressed that everyone is here. I would like to know if you have any predictions. How do you see the next in the next few years? What do you see for the for this? Um, Could you please introduce yourself? Oh, me. I'm a, a, my name is Carol Karp. I'm, actually, I have a PhD in French literature <laughs> from a very long time ago. Thank you. I am sorry to say I have no predictions. <laughs> very short, yeah. Well, I'm later. <laughs> We've got two more, I think. The gentleman here, then so, play their last questions. Briefly, pretty. Please, because they're in here. They're here. You, the two of you. Okay. I'm Jim Williams. I'm uh, here as an alumni of the Fletcher School. Um, I just this, I think, fairly short question. I'm very impressed with the pictures you have and have been displaying. I often find a picture is worth more than a thousand yes. words. Are there any documentaries of this period of time done by the likes of maybe um, an Arab in Arabic? Um, and perhaps for the Arab population, of uh, the likes of a certain like Ken, Ken Burns or something like that, if there could be. I just don't know. Uh, there is. Th there are very good people. One of them is a friend of our friend, uh, I think she left, Nadim Shahade. He's a collector. And he now he's now the director of the Faris Center at Tafs. But he is a collector. And most of these photos come from him. They come from postcards, they come from some of them from the Library of Congress, etc. But he finds them, he knows where they are. And in London, there is a, an Arab who is extraordinary, uh, who has an office and has published books in Arabic with photos and material. Th there is a lot, a lot. But again, nothing is centralized. That's the problem. No, nothing. The Palestinians are doing a superb job because of the incentive to prove Israel wrong, for example. <laughs> uh, there is nothing like having uh, an enemy to know what, what you want. What they have done is, uh, you know, the original way to say it was that uh, uh, Israel made the desert bloom. And so immediately, a bunch of Palestinians at the, I think at the Institute of Palestine Studies, which is here, uh, collected photos from the period when they were alone in Palestine, showing the cypress, cypress trees and the oranges and the groves. And, and one of those books is called Before Their Diaspora, meaning the Palestinian diaspora. And it's all about like garden after garden after garden. So in their own way, <laughs> they have tried to collect the material that proves it. But somebody like Ken Burns, I think there must be, because the cinema and the documentary in the Arab world is really becoming very good. For Arabs. Yes, Ideally yes, for Arabs. yes. Yeah. Right. And that will interest them in history, too. Final question. Well, this, this is an unplanned segue. And As a social is? historian, and maybe for a popular um, 
history. How do you explain um, the great interest of the Anamania television series coming out of Turkey and it's spread throughout the region? Your name? Excuse me? Oh, I'm Diane Tepfer. I'm an art historian. Wow. Um, I only know about the Turkish uh, television yeah. that's coming. That's, oh, you, that's what you meant. Yeah. I heard Armenian. No. Are they, are no, there is a. Oh, there's a uh, no, there is a, no, I, sorry, I misread, I heard you. There is an, a, a Turkish uh, yeah. musalsal, as they call it, you know, that is all over the Middle East, and people love yes. it, yeah, about the harem and the romantic romanticization of the life of the Ottoman past. And that's nice. I mean, it's like downtown, what is it, the, the one we see? It's like, yeah, it's like that, you know, it's equally very useful, and it makes advantage of all the treasures they have because they have so many wonderful treasures mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's that's a nice cultural rapprochement uh, that people don't believe everything they see but it's entertaining and it's useful yeah. <laughs> we haven't done enough on culture that's the main problem of the Middle East yeah. on that note <laughs> I have the unfortunate task of drawing this portion to a close. We invite you to stay and join us for a reception uh, immediately uh, after the session. We invite you to come back next week where we'll hear a talk on a very different subject. Uh, Adam Rothman of Georgetown University will be speaking on his just published book, Beyond Freedom's Reach, The Kidnapping in the Twilight of Slavery. Wow. Thank you to our uh, audience and thank you to Leila Fawaz. Thank you.